All right, y'all. Y'all ready to start? Like I was just saying, uh, this is probably nothing new that you've seen before. I know, I know we've seen it all before, heard it all before. But, but every now and then, you know, we need to um, have a, a refreshing, a renewal of, of what we stand for, what we do. Um, a couple of days ago, I was reading a story, an article about some statistics in, in Louisiana, and it shocked me. Shocked me to the core, I could not believe it. You probably won't either when I tell you. No, you probably will. 75% of high school students that are coming out of high school now don't qualify to go into the military. Either physically, academically, or they have some kind of criminal record that prevents them from getting into the military. 75%. That shock, isn't that, doesn't that shock y'all? I mean, it shocks me because I can remember back, you know, even 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years ago. I mean, just about everybody I knew that I went to school it qualified for the military, you know, at least to sign up. Now, once they got there, you know, they might have been discharged or dropped out for some reason, but at least they qualified. Today, 75% don't qualify, which means they can't even try. <clears throat> well, <coughs> I would hope if they don't qualify for the military, they shouldn't be able to qualify here. You know, just saying, just saying, just saying. Uh, but anyway, with that being said, we're here. We're here because we qualified. All of us, all of us qualified. But here's my point. There are certain organizations in this world, in this country, that I deem special organizations, uh, elite organizations. And I believe we're one of those. But in all organizations, if you don't do what you need to do to keep that organization on a high level, it's going to slip and fall. And that's part of what this class is about today. Just a renewal of, of our core values to keep us elevated as an elite organization because of who we are and what we do, what we stand for, and that's what we're going to talk about today. All great organizations, all of them that I've researched, follow a set of core values. CJ, what's the core values of the Army? Honor, integrity, and uh, um, sacrifice, maybe something to that effect. That's right. Uh, the Marine Corps' honor, courage, commitment. Uh, the New York City Fire Department, I, they, I, they escape me right now, but they have core values. Yeah. L LA Fire Department. Uh, uh, the, the, the Navy, Honor, Courage, Commitment, uh, the Air Force, whatever, all great organizations have a set of core values that they follow. Guess what? We have some now, too. They're right here on your paper. Our core values are honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. And we're going to go through those and renew our um, dedication to those core values. See, a lot of times, core values are not even stated, but you know you follow a set of core values. And with that being said, all these organizations we just talked about have different words for their core values. But you know what? They all intersect at the same meaning, okay? Um, some say leadership, you know? Some have uh, um, commitment, service, you know? But they all, they all intersect at the same meaning. Because it's a value we follow in our organization to keep it a great, an elite, a special organization. Um, so anyway, our core values are honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. And we're going to talk about them, go through them, and try to understand them. Okay? So I'm going to show you a little video it's for, to start off with. It's kind of a boring uh, video. But... 
it will kind of explain to you what core values mean and, uh, and why we have them. So you can have core values. Any a lot of organizations have core values, and it's a slogan on the wall when you walk into their, their building, you know, in the reception area. Core values for whatever company ABC, all right? But it's a slogan on the wall. And they, they have these core values, but they don't follow them. Most people that work there don't even know they have them, don't even know what they are. If they know what they are, they don't even know what they mean. So with that being said, this is ours. We're going we're gonna to study them today, learn them, under, try to understand them. I want this class to have discussion. You know, if you've got something to add, please, please do. Um, because I know you all, and when we're out there, you always got something to add. So, Peter, add it in here. So, anyway, let's watch this little video. Like I said, it's kind of boring, but it may help you understand kind of what I'm talking about. To understand your core values, you have to understand and know your culture. And in order to do that, you need to know what culture is. The reason culture is so hard to define is because culture is everything. It's a collection of people that together create a way of being. When you enter in their space, culture is what you sense and feel through your skin, nose, ears, eyes, and heart. It's the scent in the air, the laughter, the seriousness, the way people are treated, the way people interact the way they communicate, the way they carry themselves, the unspoken language, the level at which they function or don't function, and the way they treat each other. Culture engulfs all of this. Culture is everything. When you know what defines your culture through a few easy to understand core value statements, you can instantly see which team members, customers, or suppliers fit or don't fit in your culture. Herb Kelleher, founder of Southwest Airlines, talks about an upset customer, Diane von Thurstenberg who wrote him a letter and said she didn't like the company's ambiance. Herb wrote back to a dissatisfied Diane, stating that he didn't know what ambiance was. He was just damn glad to hear that they had one. When Thurstenberg was complaining about Southwest's ambiance, she was saying that she didn't like their culture. And at Southwest, if you don't like the jokes, humor, and camaraderie that is ingrained in their culture, you might reconsider flying with them or working with them because you won't change it. Southwest and many other successful companies live by a set of clear and documented core values that define their culture. It makes it easy for them to decide who they should and should not associate with because as we know, you can't be all things to all people. <coughs> Unfortunately, the term core values has become a buzz phrase and although many companies display their core values on the wall, the entire culture might not live them or even know what they mean. The reason is that core values have become a management flavor of the day. In many companies, core values are proudly displayed all over the office where most people snicker at them because they don't know what they mean or few in the organization are with them. And then there are companies that don't put a lot of thought into defining words like integrity, commitment, and attitude. They sound good, but your culture doesn't know what they mean. At EOS, worldwide, we get the leadership team to get clear on a few statements or words that leave nothing to interpretation in defining their culture, and we get them to live them by hiring, firing, rewarding, and recognizing people based on what those core value statements mean. Those that don't fit either adjust and realign their values, or they leave. We get someone from the company, usually the founder, to deliver a core value speech so that everyone understands what the core value statements mean. They explain what the core value is, the story behind it, and give some analogies and our examples behind each of them. The core value speech is about taking your core values off the wall and living them. Here is Lindsay Dodd, visionary and founder at Savia IT Solutions, defining his first core value, be curious. This is an excellent example because after you hear it, there is no confusion of what it means. Number one, let's talk about being curious. 
We've described Be Curious as driven by curiosity. We seek to listen, to learn, and to understand. So what does that really mean? At the heart of curiosity are questions. We ask a lot of questions before we move to answers. The more that we know about our customers, our partners, and our people, the better we can help. Curiosity is about learning. In our industry, we need to be learning every day. And that these days stable in IT. We change every day. Each and every day, we need to be learning about new technology, new skills, new companies, and new people. Curiosity is about how can I help. Curiosity is the foundation of humility. Only when you are truly curious about people can you be of humble service to them. Curiosity is the natural enemy of arrogance. It is impossible to be arrogant and truly curious at the same time. We absolutely love people who are curious about us, and it works both ways. Curiosity kills the most dreadful of habits, and that's the assumption. We cannot assume and be curious at the same time. No two companies have the same core values, and each has their own way of telling the story. Giving examples and analogies solidifies the meaning of the core value. Here's Dave Wallace, founder of Specs, Specialized Property Evaluation Control Services Limited, giving an example to further help define their meaning of teamwork. We are a team of net givers, not net users. At the end of the day, we understand that we must give more than we get, or we will not succeed in our goals. An example of this teamwork uh, that really stands out for me is the Calgary Fund of 2013. This was the single largest source of property damage in Canadian history at the time. As a team, we provided 26 appraisers from across the country to assist the four personnel in the local branch. From logistics to emergency reporting in critical situations, we provided our clients with the resources they needed to return their lives back to normal as fast as possible. At just the surface level, our people canceled their vacations, and those that went to site spent weeks at a time away from home. The team was not only those people that went to site, but just as importantly that those that stayed at home and picked up the extra work that we normally get over that period in the local market. No one stood up on our team and said, I did this or that, and no one was recognized as contributing more than another person. But the company received numerous accolades from a number of different sources for our response. The core value story leaves no person in the culture uncertain about its meaning. The story is documented or even videotaped so that it can be consistently delivered and clearly understood by every single team member in the organization. It's a lot easier to assess who fits and who doesn't fit a culture when everyone clearly understands and lives the core value statements. Because everyone at Savia and Specs clearly understand their culture, it just follows that everyone knows whether they fit or not. So will everyone in your organization if you take the time to take the core value statements off your wall and implement their true meaning into your culture through your documented or recorded story. It's nice that your core values are on your wall, in your boardroom, and in your company manual. But by having and delivering the story behind them, that they're not just on the wall, but in the hearts of every person in your organization. When every one of your organization is being hired, fired, recognized, and rewarded in line with clearly understood core values that define your culture, we promise, without going all kumbaya on you, that magic will start to happen. To have a healthier and more productive management team, go to www.themiraclemanager.com. Coming, y'all. Uh, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. It. Kind of slow technology.
technology wise I'm not sure oh yeah yeah sorry Keith sorry about that Sorry about that, y'all. All right, like we said, um, core values are not just a, a slogan on the wall. You know, once, once you establish your core values, we have to know what they are. Our people, everybody, every, all of our people have to know what they are. And they got to know what they mean and what they stand for. So let's talk about ours. As in the past, our past, we are... We are dedicated to the core values of honor, courage, commitment, and integrity to build a foundation of trust. And we're going to talk about trust after a while. Um, and leadership upon which our strength is based and perseverance is achieved. <coughs> These principles on which the Lafayette Fire Department was founded continue to guide us today. Every member of the fire department must understand and live by our core values. And when I say that, live by our core values. I don't mean just here. Not just here. When you get off at 7 o'clock in the morning, you should still live by those core values every day. Seven days a week. Sometimes it's hard to do. But we should build a foundation. Uh, um, we should build a, a, a trust and a commitment to live in those core values every day. For more than 100 years, members of our department have stood ready to protect the citizens and the property of our city. We are ready to carry out any mission of mitigating all our incidents, no matter how small or large, or if called upon, we will take great risk to preserve the well-being of the citizens we serve. And that includes you guys, fire prevention. Right? Because what you do is very important, just, just like us. Because, and what I mean by that, I mean, you can talk on this more than I can. If, if you go do an inspection and you just say, yeah, whatever, good, 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 and something happens where they, uh, you messed up on the occupancy numbers or the, um, the fire alarm system, the sprinkler, whatever it may be. And something happens it's on us right it's not on fire prevention it's on the Lafayette Fire Department correct All right we will be faithful to our core values on honor courage commitment and integrity as our abiding duty and privilege we talked about this a while ago the difference between a leader and a boss right you got this little handout I gave you <coughs> I was just handed that a few days ago, and I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, the difference between a boss and a leader. And uh, we'll go through it, but um, as it says on the paper, a boss demands. A leader coaches. Right? He demands. He coaches. A boss relies on authority. I'm the man. My way or the highway, right? A leader relies on goodwill. What you mean by that? What you mean a leader relies on goodwill? Our core values. Hey guys, this is what we do. We do it because it's right. I'm going to do it and you're going to follow me and we can all do it together. A boss issues ultimatums. My way to highway. You do it or I'll see you later. A leader generates enthusiasm. Follow me. Follow me. All I'm asking you is to do what I do. A boss says I. A leader says we. A boss uses people, steps on them to get to the top. You don't care about people. He's just going to use them 
to help himself. A, a, a leader develops people. I want you, when you get here, to be better than I was. That's a leader. He's going to train his people to be better than he was when he was in that position. That's a leader. A boss takes credit. A leader gives credit. Because you know what? A boss needs to realize he can't get credit without his people. It ain't happening. A boss places the blame and tells you you messed up. A leader accepts the blame and says, you know what, God, I got to do a better job of showing you what to do. A boss says, go. And a leader says simply, let's go. Follow me. The boss says, my way is the only way. And a leader says, strength and unity. If we all pull together, there's nothing we cannot pull. So that's just the difference between a boss and a leader. Right? Come on, Elliot. That's right. All right, something special. What is something special? An extraordinary or exceptional organization. Right? We are an exceptional, extraordinary organization. Why deem our, our organization special? Why? Why do I deem our organization special, exceptional, great? Anybody? Give, get, take a stab at it. Shashi, why are we a special or a special organization? Or why do I think it's special? You're out there doing good to community. But it's what you do. Because what you do. You know, most of the times when we meet our customers, the people we serve, they're having the worst day of their life. And guess what? Most times you're all they got. You are all they got. So if you're not on your best game that day, then they don't get your best game. And they have the worst day of their life. It's our job. It's our duty to be on our best game every day. Every time we leave that door. That's our commitment, man. It's part of our core values. Commitment. We should be committed to that. Total strangers. Total strangers. People we don't even know. People we probably never met. They're having the best, worst day of their life. And we got to go out there and try to make it as best as we can. And you know what? Sometimes we fail. But our job is, or our duty is, to do the best that we can do with what we have at that point. And if we do that, you can go to sleep that night and say, I did the best I could do with what I had. If you didn't, I just, I don't want to have that feeling. I don't want to have that feeling to lay my head down and say, I could have done this to save that person's life. Why didn't I do that? And, and you know as well as I know, because you've all been through it, it's happened to us. And I'm going to tell you something. I've been there. Personally, I've been there. And I've laid my head down at night and I've thought about it. And you know what? Most times I can find solace because I can say to myself, you did the best you could with what you had. So, we're an exceptional organization because of what we do. What we're committed to doing and how we do it. And we've got to keep it that way. It's our job to keep it that way, guys. Esprit de corps. Who knows what esprit de corps is? Nobody. I know you heard the term before, esprit de corps, right? That's you are proud to belong to the organization you belong to. You walk around and say, that's right, I'm a firefighter. That's right. I'm proud to be a firefighter. Should be. Just think of the day 
where you, have to, you would have to walk around. I, I, I shudder to, to even think this could ever happen. That you walk around and you've got to hide what you do. You don't want people to know you're a firefighter with the Lafayette Fire Department. Really? Think about that. We're one of the most highly respected organizations in the world today. We got to do everything we can to keep it that way, guys. I don't know about you, but that's the way I want it. And if you don't feel that way, I don't, I don't think you need to be here. I really don't. I'm not telling nobody to leave, but I'm just saying. Some special organizations, like we talked about, the fire service, the armed forces, the Knights Templar. Everybody, anybody in here know who the Knights Templar were? We'll talk about them a little bit. Knights Templar were back in the, in the, in the Middle Ages. They were founded in the, uh, 10, 1103. And they were the most fiercest fighting force in the world. What was the world at that time? The rule of thumb, when you went to battle with the Knights Templar, the rule of thumb was you had to have 10 people to their one. If you didn't have 10 people to their one, you didn't even try to fight them. That's how good they were. And their mission. They took a vow of chastity and poverty. If a nice temperer died and they found one penny on him, he was refused a Christian burial. That's, how, that's how, how strict they followed their vows. That's what we do. I just thought it was a cool picture, so I threw them in there. <coughs> Special. How and why is your organization special or exceptional? Why? Somebody tell me why this place is special. Why are we exceptional, Miles? Thank you. We perform tasks most people won't even try to do. Most people wouldn't think of doing. Most people out there, y'all, listen to me. Most people out there, they're not going to risk their life for a person they never met before, they don't know, never will know. They're not going to do that. Why? Why would they? Now, I'm going to tell you something, though. Mothers. Let me tell you something. Mothers, you can't find a stronger bond. See, they can kind of understand what we do. Mothers can because they have that bond with their child, especially a young child. Most mothers will give their life for that child. That's right. Because it's something in their soul with their child. That bond, that dedication. So they, a mother, believe it or not, can kind of understand what you do because they have that in their soul for their child. You see what I'm saying? So that's why we're special or exceptional. Because of what we do, our dedication, it's like it's ingrained in us. Remember that, that oath you took? Everybody raise your hand because I know you remember when you took your oath, right? You remember what it said? You basically took a promise, right? Remember that? You took a promise to do what, Angel? But you made a promise even more deeper than that. You made a promise that if it came down to it, you would risk your life for the people you serve, Right? You was gonna, you was gonna protect and support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Louisiana, right? The laws and regulations of the city and parish and the Lafayette Fire Department, right? And you would protect and save the property and the lives of the citizens of Lafayette, the city of Lafayette and Lafayette Parish. That's your oath. That you would risk your life if need be to protect these people, to serve these people. So that's a promise. You took a promise you said you would. Are you willing to keep that promise? I would hope each and every one of you would nod you. Yes. Took a pro you made a promise. And if you can't keep that promise, you need to go. You need to go. Goes for y'all too, right? Y'all took that oath, 
Remember that? All right, who made our organization special? Come on, man. Who made our organization special? All those that came before us, right? Give me some names. Off the top of your head, Donnie, who's one? Made this organization special. Off the top of your head. Jerry DeLome. Jerry DeLome. I respect Jerry very much. You know what? Jerry was a hothead, and he screamed at you. But he made our, he was part of making our organization special, y'all. Y'all remember Jerry. He was dedicated. And he, de he demanded excellence, right? Chief Knight, Chief Donald Knight. Wow. <laughs> y'all remember him. He demanded excellence. How about Chief Paradigm? How about Nuji Paradigm? Remember Nuji? He made this organization special. Let's go back beyond that. How about Chief Baban? We don't remember Chief Baban, but you can read about him right outside the, in the hall, in the, in the lobby right here, right? He must have been pretty special. They got a poster about him. This, this training center is named after him. So evidently, he had a big hand in making this organization exceptional, right? I mean, you've be probably, we've all heard the stories about him. I remember, Peter, you remember that when we were in the fire academy. He'd come visit us almost every day. You remember that? And he carried his little oxygen tank behind him. And I remember this. Corey, you remember that? What, what he used to tell us, Corey? Wear your SCBA, because if you don't, you're going to be like me one day. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget it. So, that's who made our organization special. Whose responsibility is it to keep our organization special or exceptional? Whose responsibility is it? It's, yeah, it's all of us. You, 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 everybody in here. Everybody, every member of this department is our responsibility to keep this organization special, exceptional. And I tell you guys, it's, it's getting harder and harder to do. Right? I mean, the, 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 the machinery of the world is against us, man. But you know what? We keep thriving and we keep, we kept, keep pecking away at it because it's our responsibility, man. Remember I told you, we up here. And if you don't do everything in your power to keep it there, it's going to do this. And you're going to get on a slide. And once you get on a slide, CJ, it's hard to stop it, right? It's, it's, it's a lot easier to stop something going this way than going this way, right? It's our responsibility, God. Keep it special. Okay, how, how do we keep it special or exceptional? How do we keep this organization exceptional? Somebody tell me something. Training, that's a good one. Sure is. Know what you're doing when you get out there for sure. Personal, you sh pride. personal pride. Esprit, how about esprit de corps? Right, we talked about, did we talk about that? Esprit de corps? Jason, how do y'all guys in fire prevention, how do you keep this organization exceptional? I'll tell you how, by the way you meet the public by the way you greet our, our customers, by the way you do your inspection, you demand, but you are courteous. Right? You enforce, but you're courteous. And you tell them, it's this way, it's got to be this way, because lives depend on it, right? That's how you keep it special. By the way you dress, by the way you walk, and the way you talk to these people. That's how you keep it. That's right. And that goes for everybody in here. At work. Not looking like a bum. That's Donnie's pet peeve, by the way. Don't look like a bum. So, thank you. Thank you, Donnie. <laughs> Hey. Don't like 
You want to be part of something elite? There you go. Think about it, guys. Every night, you know what? Every now and then it's good to have a little tune up and people be frank with you and tell you what you need to hear, right? I know it's good for me. My wife does it all the time. Hey, you know. You see what I'm talking about? Trust. Trust. We're going to talk about trust in a little while. So, how do you keep your organization special? Exceptional? Never cheat. Now, I know y'all looking at me and says, let me tell you something. I don't cheat. But I'm going to prove to everyone and you in this room that we're cheaters. I'm a cheater. You're a cheater. You're a cheater. You're a cheater. Everybody in this room is a cheater. And I'm going to prove it to you. And if you can say after I prove it to you that, guess what? You're wrong. I don't cheat. Well, let me tell you something. You are an exceptional individual. And I bow to you. So what do I mean by cheaters? How do we cheat? When we can wake up one morning, let me tell you what I do, personally. I'm going to just tell you personally what I do. Every morning I wake up, there's a few things I do. But one of them is, I tell myself, today, I'm going to do the best I can do at everything I do. Okay? Now, most days I fail. Okay? I really do. So I cheat. That's cheating. If I don't do the best I can do at everything I do, I'm cheating. Do you do the best you can do at everything you do every day? Then you're a cheater. Lord, who does in this room can say that every day when I get up, from the time I get up to the time I lay my head down in bed, I do the best I can do at everything I do. Raise your hand if you do that every day. There you go. See, we're all cheaters. But there's hope. There's hope as long as you don't give up. When you fail, you get back up and you... Pick it up again and says, from here on out, I'm going to do the best I can do at everything I do. Okay? Don't give up. Because if you don't give up, maybe one day, my goal is to one day, to have one day that I can say, man, today I didn't cheat. Today I didn't cheat. Raise your hand if you've been to Arlington National Cemetery and watched the changing of the guard. Raise your hand. Well, I don't have to tell you guys how special those men are, right? See, I don't think they're cheaters. I mean, look, look at him. I don't know how cold it is, but it's pretty darn cold because he got his over boots, his overcoat, his hat, and there's snow on the ground. So I would think it's pretty cold right there, right? Right here. I mean, it's, it's raining cats and dogs, right? Look at that picture. I mean, it's storming, guys, and they ain't moving. They're not moving. I'd say pretty special. He's not even shivering. These guys are amazing, man. They're amazing. You see, here's the deal. From the top of their hat to the bottom of their shoes, their weapon, their gloves, their glasses, their uniform, their medals, everything's perfect. They're as perfect or as close to perfect as you can get as a human being. They're as close to perfect as you're going to get as a human being. I, myself personally, I, don't, I, don't, I think there was only one perfect human being that ever walked this earth. That's my opinion. But these guys are as per, close to perfect as you can get. But here's why, here's why I don't think they're cheaters. When you go watch them, whether it's 9 o'clock in the morning, and they got 400 people watching them do the ceremony for the changing of the guard, or if you go in a snowstorm or a rainstorm or 2 o'clock in the morning, Guess what? They're the same. There's no difference in how they dress, how they walk, how they perform. If there's nobody around, the dead of night, there's nobody around. They do exactly the same at not, as they would at 9 o'clock in the morning when there's 400 people watching them. 
That's dedication, man. You know why? They don't cheat. Because it's not that somebody else is not watching. It's in their soul. It's in their heart. And they know, if I don't do the best I can do at this, I know I didn't do the best that I can do. It's in your heart. And, and that's the kind of people we are. We know when we messed up. We know when we didn't do the best we can do. That's, that's the feeling we have, right? <coughs> See, that's what I'm talking about, man. Don't cheat. Don't cheat. All right, let's take a, let's take a break. Clicker. All right. Laughing Fire Department core values. Let's look at them, y'all. Guys, no ladies today. Honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. That's our core values. That is our adopted core values. Honor. We'll honor our profession and those who serve before us. Okay, what does that mean? We will honor our profession and those that served or who served before us. What do we mean by that? Come on, man. Somebody give me something. I'll keep picking on Pete. Ooh. That's right, man. Honor. We got to honor our profession and those who served before us. So if we do something um, underhanded or slight. You know, underhanded or, or, or illegal or immoral, whatever. It, it don't just tarnish me personally. I tarnish every one of you, right? If, if, if I'm a screw up on this job, by the time we, I mean, y'all know how the fire department works. If somebody screws up, it goes from one end of town to the next from that fire station to the one the farthest down south before you can even use the telephone, right? I don't know, some way it's got, that information got a way of just flying around the city and everybody knows what happened, right? I'm right, I'm wrong. But here's my point, honor. If, if somebody messes up, it don't just tarnish that guy, it tarnishes every one of us. If somebody's not a good fireman, it tarnishes all our reputation, the whole department. If somebody messes up in fire prevention, it don't just tarnish fire prevention, right? It tarnishes the Lafayette Fire Department. We don't have different departments. We are one department, the Lafayette Fire Department. And it's the responsibility of everybody. Like we said earlier, every member of this department, no matter what division you work in, to have honor. And to honor our profession and those that served before us. Right? With me? You with me, Carol? All right. You good, right? All right. <laughs> honor. Our honor our profession and those that served before us. How about courage? We will possess both physical and moral courage. All right. Well, we all know what physical courage is, right? It does take a little bit of physical courage to, to, to go through a door and crawl underneath flames and start fighting a fire, right? I mean, especially when you open that hole, that steam starts burning the back of your neck or your ears or what have you. It takes a little bit of courage to buckle down and stay at it till you knock it down. Right, Kara? All right. That's, so that's physical courage. How about moral courage? See, you guys deal with moral courage all the time, right? <coughs> What's moral courage? Somebody give me an, a, an example of moral courage. Spire. You don't have nothing for me? I got right. There you go, sir. Stand up for what's right. right. That's right. Moral, uh, moral courage. You know what? I was doing this program for a baseball team one day. And uh, I asked this young guy. I think he was 17 years old. And he probably gave the best definition of moral courage that, that I could even dream of. And you know what he told me? I said, I said what's the, give me an example of moral courage. And, he, and this is what he said. And I was shocked by this young man's answer. And he said, well, 
He said, you know, my, I think my example of moral courage is, he said, you know, in school, he was in high school, it was a high school baseball team. And he said, you know that guy that wears the big black glasses and we call, it, we call him a nerd? Y'all know what I'm talking about because we all had one in our, in our school, right? Everybody, look, you had a nerd in your school? Yeah, okay. And he said, I think, he said, my example of moral courage is, is you decide one day, because everybody picks on this guy. Everybody walks by, they pick on him, they push on him, and they, you know, they downtrod him, and you know what I'm saying. And he said, my example of moral courage is to one day you go and you stand up with that guy and you tell everybody that goes by, that's enough. Go against the grain and standing up with him and telling everybody goes by, uh, uh, not today, that's enough. That's moral courage. I, 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 was, I was astounded at the answer this kid gave me, a moral courage. And he's right. And I told him, I said, you know what? I can't give you a better definition than that. That's moral courage. Always standing up for what's right, no matter what. See, that's not cheating. If you can do that, you're not cheating. About commitment. A commitment to honesty and serving our people with dignity, respect, and excellence. Excellence, Donnie? What is excellence? What is serving our people with excellence? And dignity and respect. Remember, that's, that's what? Waking up in the morning saying, I'm going to do the best that I can do in everything I do today. Be excellent. See, see, it, it's almost impossible to be excellent, right? But we can try. You can try. If you're making the effort to be excellent, and you're doing what you're supposed to do, you're learning what you need to learn, and you're putting in the effort to do the best you can do at everything you do, you're going to come close to excellence. One day we might get it. That's my goal. To achieve excellence one day. Integrity. Integrity means we will never betray the trust. Placed in us by our peers and the citizens we serve. Now I can't tell you how much the people you serve trust you. They trust you. And I'm going to give you a personal story. That... that touched me and I realized how much how much the public trusts us remember we talked about a mother and the bond with her child there's none stronger remember the flood of 2016 y'all remember that right the flood of 2016 August 16th I think it was or something like that August of 2016 we had the flood and we responded to this call on Alice Drive. And if you go down Alice Drive, way before you get to the river, it drops down and it gets down below the, you know, sorry, sorry. It goes down, it goes off the hill and it goes down toward the river. And there's a bunch of houses, nice, big, beautiful houses down there. Anyway, we get a call and we go to this house and the water's just pouring in, man. The water's rising. So we get these people out, they can call nine. When we get them out, we bring them to the, to the, um, to the engine, put them safe in the truck, and, and the water's rising. And the lady tells me, she says, would you go check in our neighbor's house? Because she said, they have some young kids, and I haven't seen them. I said, yes, ma'am, we're going to do that right now. So myself and my fireman, or two firefighters, we went in the house, and sure enough, they in there. Not as a man. The woman, a toddler, he's probably four or five years old. I think he was five years old. And an infant, I think was four or four to six months old. I, I, it escapes me exactly how old. It was four to six months old, a, a little baby. And the man is, he's just, he's stunned. He don't know what to do. Now they're standing water up to their ankles and you can almost see it rising. And they literally don't know what to do. They're just standing there 
stunned, in a daze. So I walk in the house. I say, sir, we need to get out. The water's rising. Okay, what should I do? At that point, I knew I had to give them something to do because they didn't know what to do. I told them, I said, your job, you need to go pack a bag, put some clothes for the kids, the baby, you know, get medicines, do it. You got to get some stuff, one suitcase that you can throw, a few clothes and, and uh, uh, necessities that you need to bring with you. He said, okay. So he goes and he starts doing that. So he's got a mission, so he's all right. At this point, he's good. And here's the mama. She's in the same fix. And I tell her, I said, ma'am, you need to go get whatever you need for your baby, the bottles, you know, some formula, uh, uh, medications, whatever you need for that baby, in a short term, you need to grab it. Put it in a bag and bring it. She said, okay, I got that. So anyway, while they're doing that, I tell my, one of my firefighters to take the toddler, the little five-year-old, and I handed it to one of my firefighters. And I said, take this kid to the truck, to the, to the engine. And I said, whatever you do, do not drop this kid. At this point on the street, the water's about this deep. So he leaves and he carries the toddler to the, to the rig. So the dad comes, he's got his bag. The mom comes, she got all her stuff. And I take the baby and I put him in a, a little, it's like a little, you know, the little toddlers, the little baby seat. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what they call that. I'm, see, it's been so long, but anyway, you know, the, the baby seat. I put the baby in the seat, we strap him in. And I tell the dad, I said, go to the, you know, go to the rig. And then I pick up the baby in the little seat, and I hand it to the mom, and I tell her, I said, ma'am, I said, whatever you do, don't drop this baby. And she says, mm-mm, no. She said, you're carrying my baby. I'm like, okay. At that point, at that point, I realized how much this lady trusted me or us. And it... It, it stunned me. So believe me, I took her baby, she's holding my arm, and we walked to the engine. By the time I got to the street, the water was right here. I literally had to hold the baby up to keep it out of water. And we got to the, to the uh, engine, and, you know, we went from there. We, uh, we got him to a shelter, and, but trust. These people trust us, y'all. Never betray that trust placed in us by these people. Never betray that trust. And the only way to hold that trust is to do the best you can do at everything you do. Don't cheat. Do what you're supposed to do to learn what you got to do in this profession. Don't go out there and guess. Train, like Carol said earlier, train. Learn your job. To the best you can because they trust you to do it how many people are married in here what happens when you lose trust in a marriage it's pretty much over right yeah well so you know what I'm talking about once you lose trust it's gone it's gone it's very hard, if, poss if at all possible, to get it back. I mean, think about that. Don't lose that trust, guys. All right, let's talk about the first one again, honor. I am accountable for my professional personal behavior. I will be mindful of the privilege I have to serve my fellow Americans, the citizens we serve, right? It's an honor and a privilege to be here. To serve these people. Do you feel that way? Do you, do you think it's an honor to wear this uniform? If it's not, you need to leave. You need to leave. If it's not a privilege to you to wear this uniform and call yourself a Lafayette firefighter, you need to leave. We don't need you. I will. Abide by an uncompromising code of integrity, taking full responsibility for my actions, and keeping my word. <coughs> keeping my word. Don't lie to me. First thing I tell every time I get a new firefighter, you know, every year we have station switches. 
And I, first thing I tell my new firefighters, don't ever lie to me. No matter how bad the truth is, we can deal with it. We can deal with the truth. But if you lie to me, we are done. I will conduct myself in the highest ethical manner in relationships with my seniors, peers, subordinates, and especially civilians that we serve. It's our responsibility to treat everybody that we meet every day with an ethical manner. I, I will be honest and truthful in my dealings within and outside the department. What that means. Shasha, what that means. Within and outside the department. You're always on duty, always on duty man. You can't be honest today and then tomorrow you're off. You know, we're going to just kind of go along. Can't do that. Because if you do that, you ain't following a, a code of... Uh, uh, you know, you can't, you can't follow a core value one day, and then tomorrow we're going to just put it aside till I go back to work. Every day. I will make honest recommendations to my seniors and peers and seek honest recommendations from my junior personnel. It works both ways, right? Works both ways. Man, we can depend on our young firefighters. Because you know what? They, man, they know a lot more about some stuff that we just didn't get, right? You know, like, for one example, for me, is technology, you know. I'm, dude, I'm crippled on technology pretty much, you know. I mean, I can get by, but some of these kids, they just whiz kids at that stuff, you know, because they, they grew up with it. Some guys on your group, like uh, last year I had a firefighter, my youngest firefighter. He was a certified electrician. Man, you know how useful that is in our, in our profession? He was a certified electrician. Had his license and everything. Well, guess what? When we went to a call where they had electrical short, guess who was the man? Him. Right? Hey, what we need to do, cousin? It works both ways, man. You know how strong we are as a team? If you got an electrician, you might have a plumber, a carp, whatever. Man, makes a crew pretty special. I will encourage new ideas and deliver bad news forthrightly. Don't lie to me. You lie to me, we done. Bad news, bring it to me. Let's hear it. We can deal with the truth. We can deal with the truth, y'all. Don't lie to me. I will fulfill my legal and ethical responsibilities in my public and personal life. Every day, all day. You're a fireman 24-7, right? You represent us 24-7. Because you know what? They, well, when you do something wrong, get uh, arrested or whatever, the media loves this. What's one of the first thing they do with the biggest letters they can fit on the TV? Say that again? I don't mean just the, the guy or woman or whatever that got arrested. They, they, they just trashed the whole department. Look what these firemen do. Right, Listy? Doesn't that irk you? Huh? Uncle Yeah. Right. Yeah, I fit firefighter, he did whatever, or she did whatever, arrested for whatever. Guess what? We all trash after that, because the media made sure that we all look like trash. So the moral of my story is this, guys. Fulfill your legal and ethical responsibilities in your public and personal life, and we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. I just threw this picture up here because I like it. <laughs> and I think it has honor. I think every one of those men that raised that flag had honor. Because you know what? Here's the deal. They raised this flag on the top of Mount Suribachi, right? You know there's a battle raging, right? The battle's not over. It's just pretty much beginning. They took that ground. They said, raise the flag. 
and they probably got bullets flying over their head. Them, them, uh, their enemies probably aiming the best you can to try to pick them off. And you know what? They raised the flag. It was America's love for honor that enabled its heroes to raise the flag on Iwo Jima. Their deed was immortalized by members of an elite organization, the United States Marine Corps. An elite organization. Remember, that's what you belong to. So act like it. Act like it. Take your pants out of your boots and act like it. Number two, courage. Let's talk about courage. Courage is the value that gives me We good? Courage is the value that gives me the moral and mental strength. Remember, we talked about moral and mental and physical strength to do what is right with confidence and resolution, even in the face of temptation or adversity. See adversity? We're going to conquer it because we got courage. Temptation, we're going to conquer it because we got courage. We got moral courage and we're going to fight that temptation. That's how you do it, with moral and physical courage. I will have the courage to meet the demands of my profession. That's physical courage, right? We're going to have the courage to do what you got to do to make that situation better no matter how bad it is. Because guess what? You all they got, right? And look, this is not a, don't, don't get me wrong, this is not a dig on the police department. But when nobody else in this, this city knows what to do with a situation, who do they got to call? Who do they call? The fire department. So it's our responsibility to do the best we can do at what we do. It might be a situation you've never seen before, but we're going to do something to make it better, right? That's what we do. I will make decisions and act in the best interest of the fire department and the Lafayette Consolidated Government without regard to personal consequences. Pretty hard one, huh? It's a pretty hard one to fathom. Because today, and you all know what I'm talking about, how many times, probably more than once a day, you're going to walk around this department and you're going to hear, Man, screw the department. I'm right, I'm wrong. Raise your hand if you hear that on a regular basis. Man, well, they don't actually use the word screw, but uh, 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 y'all know what I'm talking about. All right? Am I right, I'm wrong? Okay? How many times a day you walk around on this job and you hear, man, screw City Hall. I heard that too, right? In other terms. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That irks me. I'm going to tell you why. When somebody says that about the fire department, you know what they're talking about? They're talking about you and you and you and you and you and everybody on this department. Screw the fire department. We're the fire department, y'all. So if you're screwing the fire department, you're doing it to all of us. Not, I don't know who they think they're talking about, but they're talking about their self and all of us. So That just irks me. So, whose responsibility is to pull them aside and say, hey, partner, you know what you're talking about? Y'all get what I'm saying? I will overcome all challenges while adhering to the highest standards of personal conduct and decency. Decency. Part of courage, y'all. The courage to have decency. with everybody we serve. I will be loyal to my profession, ensuring the resources entrusted to me are used in an honest, careful, and efficient way. I mean, that goes without saying. That's our job. We're going to be loyal to our profession and ensure the resources that are entrusted to us 
And we use them honestly, carefully, and in an efficient manner. Now, I'm not talking about water. You use all the water you want. I mean, you know, we're good at, we're good at using water. <laughs> and look, sometimes this is hard, man. Because right now, our resources are thin, right? Them, them red trucks we drive, getting old. Getting old. So we're not getting what I deem what we should be getting as far as for rigs and trucks and pumpers and but it's still our responsibility to do the best we can with what we got, right? So if you're on 1991 Pierce today, you do the best you can do with what you got. And that's all we can do. Don't cheat. I just put that in there because I thought it was a cool picture. I think, I think I'm in there somewhere. It looks like some, that looks like some fireman, you know. I like that picture? All right. All right, how about commitment? Let's talk about commitment, guys. The day-to-day -day duty of every man and woman in the fire department is to join together as a team to improve the quality of our work, our people, and ourselves. Who's our people? Who's our people, Corey? That's right, the people we serve. That's our people. That's our people. We took an oath to serve those people. That's our people. Whether we like it or not, that's our people. I will foster respect up and down the chain of command. It is. It, it's a challenge. Sometimes it is a challenge. But it's our responsibility to do the best we can at everything we do. It's hard, but we can do it. Right, Carol? We can do it for how long? Two, two more years? Two and a half. You see, you can do that for two and a half more years, right? That's right. I respect you for it, too. You're right. I will care for the personal and spiritual well-being of my people. Oh, what that means. What that means that you're going to care for the personal and spiritual well-being of your people. How about an example? Sometimes in our profession... It gets hard. For the stuff you see, the things we do, and it's every now and then, something happens that triggers something in somebody. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Now I'll give you one example. I'm not going to tell you who he is. But it's quite a few years ago, I had a young firefighter. And he woke me up one night about I'd say one night, one morning, about 2 o'clock in the morning. He woke me up. And he says, Captain, I need to talk to you. Thank you. And I was like, okay, what's going on? He says, so he said, I just need to talk to you. So we went to the office, and I made some coffee, and we sat in the office, and we started talking. He told me, he said, I, I want to quit my job. I said, what? He said, yep. So I, I, I just, and look, we had a bad week that week. We had a... We had a wreck that we had a decapitation. We had a SIDS, a, a baby died, a, you know, the SIDS, a baby died in the crib, couldn't revive it. Uh, we had a fire where we lost a couple in, in that fire on, off of a pin hook. Two people, we lost two people that day. So we had a bad week, and he just literally said he couldn't take it no more. And he said, you know, Captain, he said, they told me in the academy that I, I, would, I would see this, I would face this. But he said, I didn't think it would be so much so fast, you know. I guess he thought it was going to ease into it. But it hit him all at one time. All in one week he had that. He said, I, I don't think I can, can do it anymore. So I said, well, let's talk about it, you know. Let's talk about it. And we talked from 2 o'clock in the morning till the bell. At 7 o'clock. And we talked. And we just talked. And we just talked about personal issues. We talked about kids. We talked about 
life. We talked about how this happens, why it happens. We can't control what happens sometimes. But I'm going to tell you, when we finished talking, he told me, he said, I feel like a hundred pounds been lifted off my shoulders. He said, I, he said, I feel so much better. Thank you for talking to me. Yo, that's all he needed. Just need to get it out. You just need to talk to somebody and get it out. That's what he needed. He's still here today. And he's a good fireman. I take him. I take him on any fire I go in. That's all he needed. Remember that, God. Remember that. Sometimes they just need to talk. Personal and spiritual well-being of, of our people. You might have a civilian that needs to talk to you on the scene. Sir, can I talk to you? Sure. You might just need to talk for a few minutes. Remember that. Remember that. I will show respect toward all people without regard to race, religion, or gender. It goes without saying, you know. I will always strive for positive change and personal improvement. Hey, there we go again. I'm going to do the best I can do. At everything I do, right? I'm going to strive for personal improvement. I'm striving for excellence, remember? I'm striving for excellence. I will exhibit the highest degree of moral character, professional excellence. There's that excellence word again. Quality and competence in all that I do. That's what we've been saying all along. I'm going to do the best I can do at everything I do. Commitment. We all know who that guy is. Raise your hand. You know that guy. Well, for those of you that don't know him, I'm going to give you a little story, personal story of commitment from this guy. Now, we all know Glenn died of cancer. Okay? But what you all don't know is what he did while he was sick with cancer. He was dying. He was dying and he had a commitment that he was coming back to this job. He needed to finish this job so he could, wife and his kids could get some retirement, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. And he was committed to that. And he came back and he had to go through a fit for duty test. Remember that? So he sent him over here to go through the maze. And Chief Barron was there. And his crew took him through that maze so he could qualify to come back to duty. And with the help of his men and the crew, he did it. Y'all remember that? He did it, y'all. And he was able to finish his career so his wife and kids could have a retirement. Now, is that commitment or what? Chastity, is that commitment? All right. Just think, if we all had just a slither, slither of that kind of commitment. Think about that. Commitment. Another example of commitment, a personal friend of mine. This is in the lobby of the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. Remember that day, right? Everybody remembers that date. It's hard to see, but you see this guy right here? He just, you can see his, his, kind of see him. Anyway, his name is Terrence Hatton. He was the captain on Rescue One in New York City, stationed in Manhattan. One of the first rigs to the World Trade Center. Okay, well, this picture, they're in the lobby, and a personal friend of mine, he's retired now, but they responded on Squad 288. They got to the World Trade Center, and they, somewhere in the, they're not in this picture, but they're here. And my buddy's captain, his captain went and talked to him. They were personal friends. They, they went through the academy together, and they were real close, real close friends. There were some firemen. And his captain went talk to him, the captain of Rescue One. 
And my buddy told me, he said, I'm watching them, and they talking. And he said, for a few minutes, they talk. And he said, Terrence kissed his captain on the cheek. And he came back, and he's like, huh. his captain guy said, dude, what's up with that, you know? Like, that's not natural. He said, man, he said, y'all know Terrence, yeah. They call him, uh, how, how did they call him? He was like, he was the man. He was uh, rescue captain, rescue one. I mean, that's the most elite company they claim in the world. And he was the man. He, he, he knew he, he was excellent. He knew his job. He was committed to his job. He was dedicated to his job. And he was just, he was just that good. So anyway, my buddy told me, his captain told me, he said, man, he said, he told me, he said, we're probably not going to see the sun set today. He said, it's bad. He said, I'm telling you it's bad. He said, be careful. And he said, he kissed me on the cheek and he said, it'd been nice knowing you. Or I love you or something to that effect. And he turned around and he got his crew. He had his assignment. He said his assignment was to go up those stairs and get as many people as he could get out of that building. And that's what he did. He turned around. He got his crew. He told them how bad it was. He told them what was going on. And they went up them stairs with not a bat of an eye. And they didn't see the sunset that day. Commitment. Is that commitment? That's committed, y'all. Now look. Just think if we had just a slither of that commitment, how great would we be? How great would this organization be if we had just a little bit of that commitment? I think we do. All right, integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is following your moral and ethical convictions. And doing the right thing in all circumstances, even if no one is watching you. Them, them guards at the tomb, they must have a lot of integrity, right? Because they do the right thing when nobody's watching them. They're exactly the same at 2 o'clock in the afternoon as they are at 2 o'clock in the morning. The uniform, you know, I don't know if you know this, but at the tomb, you know, it's a big place. And there's a big, like, a, a lobby where, you know, it's like a museum. And underneath all that, there's a bunker for the guards. That's where they stay. By the way, they work the same shift we do, 24 hours on, 24 hours off. The exact same shift we work. And there's a bunker down there. That's where they stay. They have living quarters, you know, uh, uh, a kitchen, uh, a day room, just like a fire station. That's where they stay. And... Each guard has a, you know, a shift during that day that they, they, uh, they rotate. And there's two sergeants there. But before each guard goes out, they're, they're inspected. And there's not a speck of lint on them. Their, hair, their uh, hat is straight. Their hair's in place. They're if it's a sunny day, they wear glasses. If it's a rainy day, they have a, a Nova coat, raincoat. If it's cold, you saw what they wear. But all of that is inspected before they go out to guard that tomb. And, and they're per as close to perfect as you can be. And it's not because of who's going to be watching them. It's because of who they're going to be guarding. That's why they do it. So... They do the right thing in all circumstances, even when nobody's watching. Having integrity means you are true to yourself, and you will do nothing that demeans or dishonors yourself. Because you know what? When you dishonor yourself, you know you did it. It's in your heart. It's in your soul. You know what you did. You can't fool yourself. Right, Lloyd? You might better fool, fool somebody else, but you can't fool yourself. That's right, Aspire. Can't fool yourself. You know what you did. I will keep my promises even if it takes extra effort. That oath you took, that's a promise. You're going to keep that promise even if it takes extra effort, which most of the time it does. 
I will never betray anyone's trust, even if it means hardship for me. We talked about that trust. We talked about that trust. Our people trust us. And it all goes back to what we said earlier. Honor our profession and those that serve before us. See, they started way, way back, over 100 years ago, they started building the trust they have in us, right? They didn't just start trusting us yesterday. They didn't just start trusting us the day of that flood. They've been trusting us for a long time. And that legacy of trust is moved down to us now. We can't betray that trust because like we just talked about, once you betray trust, it's gone. When I can't trust you no more, you ain't getting it back. I can tell you that right now. I'm telling you, you're not getting it back when I can't trust you no more. Especially in a life-threatening situation. If I can't trust you that, I don't want you nowhere near my crew. Most importantly, because of my people. It's our responsibility to get them people home tomorrow morning. So if I can't trust you, you need to sit on the bumper till I can get somebody else to replace you. I'm not saying I don't trust you. No, 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 I'm not, not at all. Not yet. I will never betray anyone's trust, even if it means hardship for me. I'm going to do what I got to do to keep their trust. And you know what? It may mean giving my life one day to keep that trust. But I made that promise. Now, I'm not telling you foolishly to go throw your life away. Don't get me wrong. But y'all know what I'm talking about. It happens over 100 times a year in this country. God forbid. I hope it never happens again. But it will. Because they're going to keep their promise. I will not gossip. Oh, this is a good one. I will not gossip or talk badly about someone or someone else or anybody. Pretty hard. Hey, listen, I can tell you right now, I'm probably right. We probably all did this from one time or another, right? Honestly, raise your hand if, you, if you're in that group. Everybody except Carol. I read my hand, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was short term. Just, I'm just speaking at you, Carol. Hey, we good, all right? We good. All right. You know, hey, and we joking about it, guys, but this is, this is, um, I, I, it's hard. This is really hard. I mean, especially when you got a, 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 a how can I politically put this? A what? A screw up, oh, that's a good one. When you got a screw up and you constantly got to uh, um, correct or coerce or teach or whatever, you know, and then you get the next day you with your buddy, my old, old Peter. Peter, I don't know what I'm going to do with this guy, man. Let me tell you about him. That's gossip, y'all. Now, there's a way to gossip, and then there's a way to talk about something without being a gossiper. Or talking badly about someone. And here's the difference. Peter, I got this farmer. Let me tell you. This guy's a screw up every day. You know what he did yesterday? He did this, this, and this. I, I want to fire that guy. Or I can come to Peter and say, Peter, look. We go back a long way. I got this farming, man. I, I need some advice. This is what's going on. I need you to help me out. What do what, what you think? What would you do? Okay, that's not gossip. That ain't gossip. I'm trying to get some advice and some help from a fellow captain to try to correct and help somebody and make them better. Y'all see the difference? Y'all know what I'm saying? There's a difference between gossip and talking bad about somebody or talking to get some advice and help to help somebody, right? So, starting today, we're going to not gossip and talk bad about somebody. We're going to try to talk in a positive manner, right? Okay? Y'all see what I'm getting at? Y'all know what I'm talking about. Kind of hard to do, but hey. We will. 
try. We will try not to gossip or talk badly about somebody. Okay? Let's throw try in there. All right. I will remain true to my spouse or partner. You know, don't say, well, why you threw that in there? Because it's part of integrity. Remember, you're a fireman 24-7. So, if you're not, excuse me, if you're not true to your spouse, then how can you be true to me? Trust, right? It goes back to the old trust word. How can I trust you if your spouse can't trust you? I'm just saying. I know that's getting into personal issues, but there it is. I will not let someone else take the blame for something I did. That goes back to the old boss and leader thing. Remember that? I despise that, you know, letting somebody take the blame for something somebody else did. How many times do you see that? Oh. You know in your heart if you did it. Don't let him take the blame for it. Sorry, Miles. I did that. It's on me, guys. It's on me. That's my fault. Yeah, I don't know. I told him not to do that. You're lying. You did it. I wanted to say something. I can't remember what it was. I'm getting old. Don't let somebody take the blame for something you did. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. And, and this happened recently. No names. Went to a fire. And it was a two-story building. And the fire's, the fire's basically out. It's, they starting some overhaul and whatnot. And there's a guy upstairs, and he's knocking out windows. Cling, cling, cling. A farmer, a young farmer, a good farmer, a go-getter. And he's knocking windows out. And then the AC's outside. He said, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, stop. No, don't break nothing else. Don't break no more windows. So he stopped. And now I know this guy didn't just go up there on his own and said, you know what? I'm going to break all these windows out. I know he didn't. There's no way he made that decision. You know what his captain said? I told him not to do that. I told him not to do that. You know, he's telling people this. Well, he lied. I know that kid didn't do that on his own. Somebody told him to knock those windows out. Just saying. Don't let somebody else take the blame for something you did. Simply say, yeah, I, I told him to do that. I figured we need to knock these windows out to finish clearing the smoke out. And it's done. We finished with that. I will never divulge confidential information that is entrusted to me. That's an important one, guys. If somebody comes with you with some personal, confidential information, they trust you enough to give it to you. And they believe you're not going to go around and say, man, you know what so so told me? Get, get this. Y'all, hey, y'all come see. That's gossip, man. And God trusted you to give you that information. It might be something very personal to him. Don't be, don't be spreading that around. He trusted you with that information. He might have needed to talk to you about it. He didn't want to talk to every. He didn't want everybody to know about it. Don't do that. It's part of integrity. Have the integrity to not divulge that information he gave to you. He gave it to you because he trusted you and he wanted to talk to you about it. All right, all we've been talking about, remember we talked about the nice Templar? Guess what? They followed the same code we do today. They just had a different word for it. They didn't call it core values back then. They called it one word. They called it chivalry. That's pretty cool, right? I think it is. I think it's pretty cool that we have a tie to somebody so far back. An organization that was so chivalrous, but chivalry, it was a medieval, a medieval knightly system with its religious, moral, and social code. It was the combination of qualities expected of an ideal knight. 
especially courage, honor, courtesy, justice, and a readiness to help the weak. That sound pretty familiar? Man, we, we some knights. Not really. But y'all see what I'm getting at. It's, it's a pretty, pretty interesting thing. Because see, way back then, knights were like far, well, actually, I don't know if y'all may know this, the, uh, the knights hospitaller were actually the first firefighters. They were part, another sect or order of the Knights Templar. It was called the Knights Hospitals. And they were firefighters. They took, they were the medics. They fought the fires. And when they, in the Battle of Jerusalem, when they fought the Saracens, it was the hospital of the Knights. Their job was, when they would throw down these naphtha fireballs on the, on the Knights they were fighting, it was their job to run in and, and get the burning Knights out and bring them out and take care of them. Pretty interesting. I mean, that's just a little trivia. Uh, part of our history from way back. I don't know if you're even interested in it, but there it is. Anyway, that, that's what, that was chivalry. Kind of what we're talking about today. Another cool picture. I just, yeah. <laughs> so, anyway. Oh, by the way, uh, I think I'm right here. Just saying. <clears throat> That, look, that's, whoa, that, that's the nice Templar right there, by the way. And it's, then in the nice oath, you know, we take an oath. They had an oath, too. And their oath was simple. It's be without fear in the face of your enemies. Be brave and upright that God may love thee. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. Speak the truth always, even if it leads to your death. And I'll tell you something. Safeguard the helpless and do no wrong. That is your oath, arise at night. I just threw that in there. I thought it would be cool for you to see their oath. What's that? Yeah. New Jersey. Man, y'all get phone calls like that from New Jersey and New York. and Sorry about that. All right, I just threw this picture in here because I wanted y'all to, to see and understand commitment. This is, this is a commitment slide. Honor, courage, commitment, integrity. All right. This is a picture of a, a Higgins boat. Tell me if you know what a Higgins boat is. All right. Hig you know what it is. Higgins boats were made in New Orleans, actually, by Mr. Higgins or the Higgins Company. They made the Higgins boats. And that's a Higgins boat right here. Anyway, you can see they packed in there like sardines. And this is June 6, 1944. We all know it as D-Day. All right. Well, they're milling around and they're getting ready to go to shore. All right. Well, in all of these Higgins boats, there's a chaplain. In every one, every one of these boats, there's a chaplain. Why do you think that chaplain's in that boat? Just a guess. That's exactly right. That chaplain was in that boat for simply one thing, one purpose only. He was in there to offer the last rice to whatever soldiers in that boat wanted to take them. You know why? Because they were told when they got in that boat, kind of like the guy in the lobby of the World Trade Center, they were told them that, guys, probably 50% of you ain't going to see the sunset today. So they took their last rites, they went to shore, and when the tail dropped, They ran through that to shore. And you know what? A lot of them didn't make it, didn't see the sunset that day. But guess what? Is that commitment? Just think if we had a little bit of that commitment. How great would we be? I think we do. Commitment. Anyway. You see what I'm getting at? I'm making all these distinctions, but that's who we are, y'all. That's who we are. We talked about trust. The essence of leadership is trust. Because you know what? If you can't trust me, you're not going to follow me. Right, Cody? You have no way if you don't, if you don't trust me, you're going to follow me into life-threatening danger. You ain't going to do it. You might act like you're doing it, but you don't want it, you ain't going to do it. 
The only way to build trust is to earn it, right? You have to earn trust. I'm not going to trust you till you earn it. When trust is lost, we talked about this, it can never truly be regained, especially when executing life-threatening operations. If I can't trust you, don't want you on my crew. Go sit on the bumper. Okay, I don't need you. If I can't trust you, I don't need you. Right, Carol? If you can't trust nobody, you don't want them, right? They do you no good if you can't trust them. Trust in core values. How do you strengthen that trust and faithfulness to your core values? Well, the answer is easy, but in reality it's very difficult to accomplish because it takes a year of training, discipline of the mind, your body, and your soul. It goes back to what we said. I'm going to do the best today when I wake up. I'm going to do the best today at everything I do. And when you can do that every day, I guarantee you're going to earn trust. You can earn the trust when you can do that. We see there's only one way that we can truly do this job, this profession. You can earn trust when I can prove that I care more about my people, you, than I care about myself. When you can do that, you have earned trust, I guarantee you. You will have earned trust when you can do that. When you can show you care about your brothers or your sisters and the people you serve more than yourself. That's hard to do, y'all. It's hard to do. But how do you do that? For me, personally, the way I do it is, I know there's got to be something better. There's got to be something better after this is over. That's what I think. I threw this in there because I thought it was pretty interesting. This came out of the Air Force manual in 1955. I don't know if it's still in there. I plan on researching it to find out if it is. I doubt, I doubt that it is, but I just thought it was pretty cool. 1955, men cannot live without faith except for brief moments of anarchy or despair. Faith leads to conviction, and convictions lead to actions. It is only a man of deep convictions, a man of deep faith, who will make the sacrifices needed to save his manhood or womanhood today. It is obvious that our enemy will attack us at our weakest spot. The hole in our armor is the lack of faith. We need to revive a fighting faith by which we can live and for which we would be willing to even to die. That was in the Air Force Manual in 1955. Well, for me, I still believe that to this day. And then it goes on, same manual, 1955, in the same, just the next paragraph. The idea uppermost in the minds of men who founded the United States was that each and every human being was important. They knew that the importance of man came from the very source of his life. Because man was made in the image and likeness of God. He had a destiny to achieve. And because he had a destiny to achieve, he had the unalienable, unalienable rights and the inherent freedom to achieve it. That is the basic idea of our democracy. That is the keystone of our way of living. Discard that central thought, and there is no meaning to our Declaration of Independence, and there is no validity to our Constitution. Still true today, I believe, y'all. All right, let's take a quick break. All right, we're gonna uh, we're gonna start off this time with a little video. Uh, raise your hand for you. Who knows who Lou Holtz is? Or yeah, everybody knows Lou Holtz, right? Where? Right, right. Where where he coached at? Notre Dame. All right, go Irish. So anyway. It's a pretty good little video. Um, he talks about what we're talking about today. And it uh, makes a lot of sense. I think he's a great speaker. So uh, with that being said, let's watch Lou Holtz. No. 
I was born in Wallaby, West Virginia. <laughs> and I went by where I was born last night, about 10.30. I was born in a cellar at home, delivered by Dr. McGraw. We had one bedroom for my sister, myself, and my parents. We had a half bath and a kitchen. Seven and a half years we lived in that place. There was no welfare. There was no food stamps. There was no safety net. But I always had plenty to eat. Because every time I asked for seconds, my dad would say, no, you had plenty. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I bore the silver spoon, my dad had only gone to the third grade. That's all the education he had. But why was I bore the silver spoon in my mouth? Because I taught by my parents. The lights of matter are making choices wherever you are, good or bad, because of the choices you make. And don't blame anybody else, but if you get an education, you're willing to work, and overcome problems and difficulties, in this great country, you can amount to something. That's how I, that's why I wore the silver spoon. I was in this country, and I was taught personal responsibility for choices you make. And when we talk about a commitment to excellence, that's a choice you make. What do you want to do? having hopes and dreams and ambition. See, I think that is absolutely critical. Don't make the mistake I made. I've done a lot of dumb things, but let me tell you one thing I regret. We went to the University of Notre Dame. We took a program on the bottom. We took it to the very top. And for nine straight years, we went to a January one bowl, the sugar, the coffee, the orange, and the fiesta. Nobody said it before. Nobody said it since. We put it on top and we maintained it. That's the thing I regret the most. See, there's a rule in life, but you're either growing or you're dying. The tree's either growing or it's dying. So is grass, so is a marriage, so is a business, so is a person. Doesn't have a thing to do with age. My birthday candles cost more than cake. <laughs> but it has everything to do with my trying to get better, my trying to prove we got on top and say, you know, this is pretty good, let's maintain it. Let's not take any risk. We for the second of the country at Notre Dame, everybody called me an idiot. I finish his last in medical school, they call him doctor. That doesn't seem fair. <laughs> when I left Notre Dame, I never thought I'd coach again. Where do you go from Notre Dame, according to my mother, you go directly to heaven, you sit by the Pope. You, you don't coach anymore. <laughs> then I went to live in a town where the average age was deceased. <laughs> and what I found out, I wasn't tired of coaching. You have to have something to hope for, something to dream. And even though you've done great things so far, what's going to happen now? I want to give you a simple plan. Life doesn't have to be complicated. I try to keep life simple. Do you realize there are only seven colors of the rainbow? Only seven. Look what Michelangelo did with those seven colors. There's only seven musical notes. Look what Beethoven did with those seven notes. There's only ten numbers. Look what Bernie Madoff did with those 10 numbers. <laughs> <laughs> the point I make is it doesn't have to be complicated. See, you need four things in your life. If you don't have any of these four things in your life, you're going to have a tremendous void. See, everybody needs something to do. Number two, everybody needs someone to love. Number three, everybody needs someone to believe in. In my case, it's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But the fourth thing you need in your life is you need something to hope for. There's never a right time to do the wrong thing. And there's never a wrong time to do the right thing. Just do what's right. I think it's right beyond. It's right beyond time. See, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy life. Have fun. You're going to have problems. You're going to have difficulties. That's part of life. And don't tell people about your problems. Do you know that 90% of the people don't care? The other 10% are glad you got them. So you're better off. Keep your nothing. You're going to have problems. But have fun with what you're doing. People say, did you have fun doing the ESPN? Not really. Because if you have fun being here, people have fun being around. That means I don't do dumb things. And sometimes I wasn't real honest. Do everything to the best of your ability for time of life. You know, ladies and gentlemen, not all of us be all American, not everybody be first team. 
everybody can be the best you're capable of being. And I want to tell you, if you want to fail, you have the right to fail. That's what's great about this country. You do not have the right to cause other people to fail because you don't do everything that you're good in. You join a spouse, you bring a child to the world, you join a business, you join a team. You have obligation responsibilities and you owe it to other people to do the maximum you can at each and everything you do. It's not complicated. And the last rule is show people you care. And you walk in the room, you're right to do hey, here I am, look at me. I thought, no. You're right to do there you are, how can I help? I wish I knew those three rules when I was 21. I've used them for the last 40 years. There's a statue of me another day. I guess they need a place for the pigeons to land, but if you go look at it, just go look at, look at three words on the pedestal. Trust, commitment, love. Two of y'all was techno technologically handicapped. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Oh, sorry. So, pretty good, huh? It's, it's pretty much summed up what we've been talking about all morning. Um, we just call it core values. So to sum up everything we've been talking about, honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. Honor, courage, commitment, and integrity. When you wake up in the morning, make yourself a promise. I'm going to do the best I can do at everything I do. And if you do that, you're going to follow your core values. And you've got to be conscious about it throughout the day. Take, take these with you and read them from time to time. And remember what we talked about. Because, y'all, it, it really means something. It's important. Remember, people trust us. And even more than that, they're depending on us. Because remember what we said, when they call 911, they're having a bad, the worst day of their life. They're not, having a, they're not having a good day. They're having the worst day of their life. And they called you. And you're all they got. So it's important that we hold true to that honor, courage, commitment, and our integrity. And give them the best we got. Because we're all they got. I put this picture up here. Because of the man that lays under that flag, Eddie Dugas. Remember Eddie? And the reason I put him up there is because he's one of those we honor that came before us. And he was a good man. And he had honor, he had courage, he had commitment, and he had integrity. Okay? So let's go out there and honor him. And that's my class. Thank you all for coming.